Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. My co-host today, this is so exciting, I feel has one of the most aspirational careers in the entirety of genre film creation. This this director, uh, you might know from aught, an aughts treasure such as Stay Alive, from a tens treasure such as The Boy and even Brahms, The Boy 2, from the elite all-timer film Orphan First Kill, and now he is out promoting his new movie, Lord of Misrule, William Brent Bell. What else do the people need to know about you before we get started here today? Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think what you'll notice, and hopefully I won't be too distracted, is I, in my studio, have... Uh, three families of squirrels that um, (laughs) like to knock on the door. They're just part of the family here. So (laughs) so, so that's probably the only thing I could let you know that's um, interesting about my day so far. Okay. (laughs) Well, I I mean, I would be letting myself down if I didn't say Orphan First Kill, I think is one of the great one of the great horror movies of the 21st century. I have rarely had so much fun watching any kind of movie. Uh, I was thrilled. I was clutching my friend who I went to see it with. We were (laughs) gasping throughout. Uh, The definitive performance from Julia Stiles, perhaps of her career, an incredible turn once again by Isabel Furman. Uh, Were you allowed to hit the gas on the absurdity that that movie rapturously captures? Or were you working around people who were trying to pull back the the full throttle nature of that film. Uh, everybody w- was kind of on the same page. It was it was one of the, that so many great movies came out of that time period because of COVID, I think. And so because of COVID, we got more freedom to do things. Mm. Even Isabel had COVID not hit, I don't know that I could have gotten Isabel Isabel in the movie. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And that would have been you know a travesty. Yeah, um, it would have been. But because of COVID, we we were able to we had time to do tests mm-hmm. and photography tests and all that good stuff and get her in the movie. And um, and then as far as the absurd the absurdity, um, I mean, y- you could even tell by the way we shot it, um, you know, kind of in a very uh, melodramatic way. Oh yes, um, <laughs> that that we knew kind of going in that we were not everybody maybe knew, but that we were doing something that had a bit of humor to it. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. um, I I, I think the writer said in an interview that he wrote a gothic horror movie and, and I found the humor in it and, and leaned into that. And I was like, but you know, scenes like when she says, I'm going to go upstairs and fuck my husband, like (laughs) that's in the script, you know, like those things were in the script. So it's, it's, it's what it was inherently funny in that way. Uh And, um, and you know my my examples for the editor were right when we got done shooting were like election and rushmore wow um, scenes from those movies uh-huh. which if you look at them they're like you know they're movies that have kind of a love triangle and also a quasi thriller mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. you know they're they're comedies really <laughs> so and now that you know we're, we're developing a third one um it's <laughs> music to my ears it's so fun to have gone this far in one direction with that movie uh-huh. and now to be able to kind of go anywhere, you know, and, yeah. and, it, and have the green light to do that. So it can be darker in places and it can be crazier in places. Yes. And so it's where everybody's just super excited. And then the, I won't get into any details, but the, the twists and turns like totally deliver. <laughs> yes. Okay, I won't push you. We'll leave it at that. And then the, the the cause that brings us here today. Tell us about Lord of Misrule. And tell me about hearing the actual, like, dulcet tones of Ralph Innocent's voice in real life. Every year we drive him out. But he stands in the fields and waits. You know, I'll say about Ralph is, like, that's, you know, he doesn't put his voice on at all. He, mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't go, okay, let me... <clears throat> and yeah. then da-da. And he, you know... It's just the way he talks. And so he was in town a couple months ago for dinner. And um, one of the people I was at dinner with, they had never met him in person. And they were just shocked because he doesn't, it doesn't not 
sound like that. His voice. Yeah. It's just the way <laughs> his voice sounds. Remarkable. But um, uh, like Lord of Misrule is a is a folk horror movie that was brought to me by um, my producing partner James Tomlinson. Um, and uh, you know he was like, you have to read the script. It's great. And very quickly I agreed. Um, it doesn't happen that often, you know, oh, for okay. me, where I read a script um, and and I'm really hooked for so many different reasons. But mm-hmm. so Lord of Misrule is, I guess, a folk horror story. Um, it's set in the town of Barrow, which is a small village in the UK. Mm-hmm. And um, our main character is Rebecca, who is the town's new vicar. Mm-hmm. Um, and she lives with her husband and her daughter. And this is the first harvest festival, the first autumn that they experience um, the town's harvest festival, in which case mm-hmm. they kind of celebrate their pagan history. Um, mm-hmm. But of course, they don't really believe any of those old traditions anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And then her daughter goes missing at that festival. And in searching for her daughter, she starts to come to the conclusion that the town indeed does still believe in those traditions and uh and they're not exactly to be trusted and so she's kind of just forced with the decision of you know balancing her faith um and just you know being a mother like what you know what would she do to save her daughter you know how far mm-hmm. would she go to try to save her daughter now obviously you are very well known to us as a, as a director of horror cinema uh stay alive i think is an underappreciated film of the aughts era of which I am a devoted, <laughs> a devoted fan. Um, but the character that you've chosen for us to discuss today, not of that conversation, Ferris, yeah. Ferris from Ferris Bueller's Day Off was your pick. And I would love, obviously, if you're millennial or anything even around it, I'm, I'm, I'm a late millennial, millennial Gen X. You grew up with Ferris. Yeah. I get it. No. 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 I have a test today. No. No. <sighs> I have to take it. I I want to go to a good college so I can have a fruitful life. Annie, you're not going to school like this now. Oh, fine. What's this? What's his problem? He doesn't feel well. Yeah, right. Dry that one out. You can fertilize the lawn. Jeannie? Is that you? Jeannie? I can't see that far. Jeannie? I, the first thing that I thought of when this information was relayed to me, this is the most <laughs> main character, main character of all time. Like, so how do you have, or have you just always been the true hero of your own story? Or what is it about Ferris that you attached on to? I mean, strangely, I, I did relate to Ferris um, as a kid. Mm-hmm. It, like, I got kicked out of high school mm-hmm. um, and... I even had my GED framed up in my <laughs> studio here and they didn't know, they basically didn't know that I was um, not going to school for about two years and I would just <laughs> leave school and make movies and wow. all that kind of stuff, cliche stuff you hear. But, um, and then they finally, you know, brought me in they were like, look, you know, you're, you know, you're expelled, right? You know that <laughs> like, yeah. finally got you. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? And I've always, you know, had friends w- in multiple groups, always, mm-hmm. you know, like the smartest kids in class who were at the top of my class. Yeah. The nerdy guys who didn't have any friends, the jocks, mm-hmm. fraternity guys in college, like everything. And I was always kind of in those groups, but yeah. I'm not really in any, in any one of them. Yeah. So in a way, he so many things about that character in that movie and then even john hughes you know that mm-hmm. run of a john hughes movies almost also it's kind of an extension of that too mm-hmm. you know um the the kind of slightly uh, always outsider characters but still very very cool and the music and yeah. everything about it just i i think i always thought i would make movies like that mm-hmm. um, when i was a kid or i know i thought that sort of and like you said yeah i mean he's kind of an ultimate hero and it's just, it's just a movie that's stuck with me and it's, you know, I never get a chance to talk about it. So, mm-hmm. so this is a cool opportunity to, to bring it up. Now, how old were you when you first watched Ferris Bueller? Um, I might've been a teenager. Uh-huh. I mean, I might've been like 13 or something. Sure. And, you know, even, even, um, you know, kind of a precursor to that was, was 
war games. He's kind of the same thing, you mm-hmm. know, tech savvy. I mean, I was, you know, the first kid I knew who had a computer. I mm-hmm. was, that was my part-time job in high school and elementary and, and junior high school or whatever was, you know, fixing parents' computers mm-hmm. and um, just odd stuff like that. So yeah. Matthew was, Broderick, really, a, really a big, a big deal for you at that time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, Matthew Broderick and John Hughes and they didn't crisscross much, but um but definitely mm-hmm. he seemed to embody kind of this. And, and I love that type of character even today, like um, meaning somebody you can, re- somebody who's relatable, you know, yeah. a relatable hero. Um, and I've always tried to find those types of actors, mm-hmm. you know, for casting in my movies, you know, mm-hmm. guys who, whether it be Adam driver or Shia LaBeouf mm-hmm. or, you know, people who weren't obvious choices to be kind of action heroes or yeah. big actors in the way, because they're not Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I've always been um, attracted to trying to tell stories through that type of a, of an actor. And Matthew Roderick was, I mentioned him also in election, you know, it was great when he came back for that. He was great in, in murders of uh, murders in the building last year. He was hilarious for a mm-hmm. while. I hadn't seen him. Oh, Cameron, he didn't ditch us or anything. He's here. Hey, He's for here. all we know, he went back to school. He would Probably not go back to school. Home. Yeah, he'd do it. He'd just no, do it just to make not. me sweat. Cameron, come on. Makes me mad. Ladies and gentlemen, you're such a wonderful crowd. We'd like to play a little tune for you. It's one of my personal favorites. And I'd like to dedicate it to a young man who doesn't think he's seen anything good today. Cameron Fry, this one's for you. If you were watching that movie around the time when it came out and you were of like a sort of susceptible age, there was some, there was, he was a perfect folk hero for a teenager. Like he was a perfect mythic figure. And I remember that like the thing that I thought was the coolest about Ferris when I was watching that when I was young was that everybody did like him. Like it didn't, like everybody, everybody was down with Save Ferris. Everybody wanted to make sure that Ferris was okay. And I just thought like that was the most aspirational thing to me about him was that like the idea of being someone who like could fit in sort of any situation because you can meet people where they are. Like it's an incredible gift to have. And I I thought that that was the best thing about Ferris. And it seems like you were kind of one of those people too. Like I, I too, like I have my friends that I ran around with the most, but otherwise like I can kind of sit anywhere in the hallway at lunchtime and, and be okay. Yeah. And you know, yeah, that would, I mean, that one day for him was like the perfect skip day, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, And, and the fun of, of avoiding the parents, but, but, you know, what did, I forgot what the lady said, but, you know, um, just that everybody loved him, the dweebs, the jocks, the <laughs> whatever she said, that, yeah. that funny line. Oh, well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. Yet nobody, yet, he, yet in a way he kind of was coming in under the radar, you know? Yeah. Which, and of course that movie, you know, and I have projects that lean into this lately, but you know, the huge dance number, then all of a sudden Ferris Bueller is, you know, in the <laughs> yeah. middle of the of the Chicago parade or whatever, yeah. singing, you know, Beatles. And um and it was uh Oh, was that I believe was that Wayne, little Wayne Newton with Donkashan? He he did Don Kishan, yeah, and then and Twist and Shout. Oh, Twist and Shout, yeah. That's yep, what yep, it was, yep. right? And, and it was just, you know, and, and my best friend growing up, my next door neighbor is very much like Cameron. And, um, mm-hmm. and it was just like, he just always wanted him to take that stick out of his ass. <laughs> and, and he's still that way. And we, you know, we, we text every day. I'm serious, man. This is ridiculous making me wait around the house for you. Why can't you let me rot in peace? Cameron, this is my ninth sick day. If I get caught, I won't graduate. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for you. Do you know what my diastolic is? Be a man. Take some Pepto-Bismol, get dressed, and come on over here. I'm tired of this stuff. Oh, shut up. 
Hold, hold, hold your water for a second. I got another call. Hello. And, you know, there were times when I was a kid and, you know, we would camp out in his backyard and I would get him to sneak out. And then we, you know, in the middle of the night go, we're like, you know, probably around that age. Yeah. Um, and then his dad drove up, you know, I remember, and he, and he found us walking the streets at, <laughs> at the war in the morning with 12 yeah. years old. And I never felt like I could live that down with his dad, but he was like, his dad never really worried about it. But so, so I really got that sense of trying to, you know, like open up my next door neighbor, my best friend that I've known <laughs> since I was six months old yeah. um, and try to try to make him cool or not cool, <laughs> but just not so not so stressed yeah. about life. And, uh, and Mia Sarah, I had a huge crush on Mia Oh Sarah, my God. Um, a a definitive, a definitive heartthrob Mia Sarah. Just yeah. a few people have ever been as captivating on screen as Sloan. And, and yeah. And, and, you know, her and her and legend was, she was just amazing. Yeah. Ferris Bueller was such a big deal in my house that my sister's middle name is Sloan because of that character. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> what's, what's, <laughs> it's a, what a great name. You want to get married? Sure. Today? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not getting married. <laughs> why not? Why do you mean, why not? Think about it. Well, no. Besides being too young, having no place to live, you feeling a little awkward about being the only cheerleader with a husband. Give me one good reason. Why not? I'll give you two good reasons why not. My mother and my father. It's such one of those perfect fantasy movies in its way. Like, you know, not in the yeah. sense of legend, but it is a it is a movie of of teenage of youth fantasy. And when you're skipping school for two years, you know, going out and I would imagine like it sounds like making movies with friends and, and, and doing stuff like that and and feeling like these are the kinds of things I want to make when I get older. Like, what does the effect of watching something like, you know, a John and in, in, in sort of the, you know, the enraptures John Hughes era, seeing a movie like this, like how does it hit you as the kid who's going to go on to be a movie maker in their life or who is already making them, but like a professional getting paid to do it movie maker. It's weird. I guess it's kind of almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy um, sure. because I, I really did um, connect to, to that character. Yeah. And I would guess he, you know, I could imagine if we found out whatever happened to him, it would have been something, something It would have been a dream come true for him, which is kind mm -hmm. of what, you know, filmmaking is for me. Mm -hmm. um, in making those movies, it was just more because that's what interested me. I didn't think I'm counting the days until I go to film school, you know, yeah. I, I nothing like that. Just everything was going to be in the movie, you know, that was mm -hmm. interesting in life. Um, and, um, you know, we built a clubhouse into the, into the attic of the auditorium and so i would just you know go there and lock myself up there and <laughs> um and so i never really um thought i would be an actor in any way hmm. it's the same kind of thing i i, I like being behind the camera um mm -hmm. i don't like you know m much attention really so yeah staying off everybody's radar but being on everybody's radar at the same time is kind of <laughs> very fair ferris bueller maybe um it's funny when you say save Ferris, I forget, you know, there was a band, right? You know, um, <laughs> called Save Ferris. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I could imagine that he has he he has a similar path in his made up life. <laughs> in his made up yeah, I'm just remembering that the 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 principal secretary, like when she's describing all the people who like all the people who like Ferris, they think he's a righteous dude. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I, he doesn't really rub anybody the wrong way, um, yeah. except for the except for the principal, of course. It's it's a unique industry, and it's a unique kind of work filmmaking. It's not really comparable in like sort of the process of it and how it plays out to kind of like anybody else's nine to five job. It, it's it's kind of difficult to explain of like this is how it works, and you know you you sit around you know hoping you get a you're always afraid you're not going to get another job. You know it's just yeah. it's kind of it's weird to describe to people and have them believe you that it's a real job. Is someone who identifies with the kind of like 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 you, I liked what you said about like on everybody's radar, but like kind of moving below the radar. How does that serve you, or how do you work with that in an industry that can be sort of so tricky as this, where you're sort of shooting gaps and get you know, luck is a big part of it, and luck is a big part of Ferris. Like, how does your Ferris quality help you or or serve you operating through Hollywood? I think it's being able to enjoy the process and like mm. really love the process. Mm. Um, because the reason I, I was like that in school was I just didn't like the structure of school. Yeah. And I, you know, it, and it, 
it wasn't that like, okay, math, sure. Okay. I can do the math, but I don't want to become an expert in this. It's not interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And this feels like I'm not, you know, um, not living up to my potential, but I can be stretching myself in other ways, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, yet, you know, I, I, it was, it was weird for me because I would, I would do things like I have a pop-up book I made and I never went to French class, but then I won the French uh, state <laughs> festival with a pop-up book I made the night before. Wow. And then that teacher kept the pop-up book for, for a decade. And my mother finally went back and it turned out the teacher was showing it to classes every year. So kind of like. That does seem like the exact the kind of thing that Ferris's sister would hate him for doing. Exactly. And, and, and my sister it's, is, is five years older than me. And she's always said if I was a girl, she would hate me, but she doesn't at all because I'm a boy. So she's really proud of me. But um, <laughs> the so so that kind of, you know, ingenuity um, sure. or whatever. And, and then because if I look at my life, I'm like, it's no different than high school. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't go to graduation. I didn't do any of the normal traditional things, but I learned a lot. And, yeah. um, and, and the same thing kind of happened through college. Um, I was outstanding junior at my university, um, but I didn't go, even go to school. But I did it because of <laughs> putting on big concerts and raising money for, for community service. Wow. And, um, and so all that stuff is like, huh, I'm doing things. I'm just not doing normal things. And, yeah. um, and so now this is just like it's the same thing. You know, it's like cramming for tests or um, – just doing projects. I mean, mm-hmm. that's just, you know, that's what I do all day yeah. long. And I, you know, I don't really, um, I don't really look at work and regular life any different, you know, yeah. like it's, if I won the lottery, I wouldn't really change anything. And, and I, uh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I mean, there would be some things I'm sure, but, um, it's, it's, I still just kind of fuck off and, and it's just now I am focused on, storytelling and movies and stuff like that are happening. It really like, this is like, I feel like in considering characters now, like I feel like Ferris is like the dream realized of like being a guy in this world who is charming and handsome and street smart and all the ways he needs to be. I feel like you are making the best of being a guy in this world. You are like crushing being a guy in this world. Maybe. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, I'm not much of a guy's guy, you know, either. Mm. You know, and I'm, neither was Ferris, really. Neither was no, Ferris, totally. really. I yeah, love that moment enough, where they yeah. think they find Ferris, but it's like an amazing androgynous, like sexy woman who's wearing his exact same outfit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do. I mean, it's like I, I live in the middle and I, it's um, of, of so many things. Um, so which, you know, I guess. And it's interesting, you know, you, you asking in this, you know, to choose a character. And and that was that's such a, you know interesting question and then and is it you know is it about a character from a movie like the kind of movies i make more often or something yeah. or is it you know what is it and and for me it was like oh no this was pretty um obvious and the reasons why are, are you know make more sense as we talk about it yeah because <laughs> you know i i haven't spent my life going yes i want to be like ferris bueller and i want to <laughs> yeah. you know I, oh I, a true wasn't ferris a bueller <laughs> would never say that if you're you're you have it or you don't if you're ferris bueller <laughs> yeah and i feel really you know super grateful mm-hmm. just that i i still am um you know it's it, whatever you want to call it imposter syndrome or something like that they could tell you make it all those things mm-hmm. um it, you know it feels like i'm always learning on the job mm-hmm. and um as opposed to knowing what I'm doing. Um, I mean, there's something wonderful about that, like to constantly feel like you're learning on the job. Like you've been doing this now for decades. And I, I, I think that's really amazing to feel like still on every project, you're still going to be feeling your way through it and learning something as you go. Like that suggests that you're not stagnating, that you're, you're still challenged as you do this all the time. Oh my God. You know, I think, I think my last two, this movie and the last movie are my two favorite well, not favorite movies. I wouldn't say favorite. I think they're my two best movies. And so, um, that's so cool. And it's, you know, it's, it's just a function of, of trying to learn from mistakes and mm-hmm. mistakes that can happen in cr- developing a story uh, mm-hmm. or in marketing the movie and everything mm-hmm. in between. You know, it's, it's a movie can fall off the tracks at any, so many different times. And that's mm-hmm. what I constantly learn is to, is to pay attention to, um, what distractions or compromises might have a real, like, negative effect on a movie and then kind of uh, ruin everything it's it's mm-hmm. you know when you're making a movie you're like a frog in a 
slowly warming pot of water, (laughs) you know, and you don't, you know, it's a lot of little battles that sometimes uh, you can't really see until Mm -hmm. it's too late. More and more, and it's part of what I learned too, is to kind of um, trust my instincts and and require people to trust me. Um, Yeah. You developed those instincts. You earned them. You should trust them. (laughs) Yeah. I think it was Spielberg or somebody who said that it wasn't until he did uh, Schindler's List that he stopped comparing every shot or every scene Mm. to another movie. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, I'm just going to go with my instincts, you know, and Mm -hmm. and I think he's pretty famous, infamous now for and he has been a while where, you know, he doesn't storyboard or or shot list or do anything he shows up and goes okay let me look at the place and that's got to be a great feeling when you know your instincts um are they translate you know Mm -hmm. and and they have impact on an audience so it's like that's definitely a goal in doing all this and like i said the more i've found that people have trusted me the Mm -hmm. like lord of misrule I've never had a movie I've done where it's like, I mean, I think I watched it yesterday. Like I, mm-hmm. I can watch that movie for some reason over and over and over. And now that um, seems like a real comment for somebody who made a movie to be able to watch it over and over and over. You never hear that. I've never felt that. And, and uh-huh. it's, and what I realized it is it's because every movie has certain compromises or certain mm-hmm. aspects, whether it was my fault or someone else's fault or just a circumstance where mm-hmm. this, you know, huge regrets, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's like like with Orphan, it's like, you know, the fire at the mm-hmm. in the third act. It was all planned. We had everything, all our rows, our ducks in a row on how to execute that fire stuff. And then um, it was a whole different shift of brand new people. And, and when we ended up doing it mm-hmm. that weren't there during the planning oh, and okay. we could never anyway, we could never get it to the place um, that it, it was supposed to be and there's nothing you know at the end of the day there's nothing you know i could do to a certain degree i mean we Mm -hmm. kept trying and trying but i can't physically do it yeah so there's always something that like is 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 a regret and um that i wish i could have done differently or whatever and with this movie by and large there are some things i wish i could have done but they just would have made it better but there aren't there aren't compromises in this movie um and it's a you know specific type of story uh-huh it, it's so it's a yeah it's, it's a really yeah. good feeling it's time for a quick break when we come back i'll ask william brent bell what he thinks about the present and future of cinema then i'll have one quick thing before i go talking about some very feeling scene gift ideas inspired by the guests of the show that you can maybe pick up for the special people in your life this holiday season uh stick around at the end for that Hello, sleepyheads. Sleeping with Celebrities is your podcast pillow pal. We talk to remarkable people about unremarkable topics, all to help you slow down your brain and drift off to sleep. For instance, we have the remarkable Neil Gaiman. I'd always had a vague interest in live culture, food preparation. Sleeping with Celebrities, hosted by me, John Moe, on MaximumFun.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. Night-night. Somewhere in an alternate universe where Hollywood is smarter. And the Emmy nominees for Outstanding Comedy Series are Jet Pacula, Airport Marriott, Thruple, Dear America, We've Seen You Naked, and Allah in the Family. In our stupid universe, You can't see any of these shows, but you can listen to them on Dead Pilot Society, the podcast that brings you hilarious comedy pilots that the networks and streamers bought but never made. Journey to the alternate television universe of Dead Pilot Society on MaximumFun.org. Welcome back to Feeling Seen. This week, director William Brent Bell is feeling seen by the one and only Ferris Bueller. 
But Bell's own films are in a much spookier vein. His latest is Lord of Misrule, and he also directed Orphan First Kill, of which I am a gargantuan fan, in which former guest Isabel Furman, who is now 26, reprises her role as a seemingly nine-year-old girl named Esther. How about all that? Let's get back to my conversation with Brent. And now, I, one of the, when I, you know, when I, I introduced you, just one of the most aspirational careers in, in, in genre filmmaking, I absolutely love your draw toward material that does something you absolutely don't expect it to do, or the premise itself is something you, like, a made 10 years later prequel to a movie that starred a 10-year-old girl, and you're going to bring her back playing the younger version of who she even was the first <laughs> time around, and fully commit to it. We're going to half-ass this, yeah. we're going to fully commit to it. I'm going to make the boy, and then you know what? You didn't get enough of Brahms the first time. I'm going to make the boy two Brahms <laughs> edition. Like, I, what is, I want to hear about, like, a career of yes and that you have committed to in, in these movies, and that is, like, a through line Regardless of what genre it is, it's still the commitment to yes and. Yeah, I mean, um, part of it is like a movie is a is it's a pretty short story, you know. Mm -hmm. So so um, whether it's writing a movie or whatever, or making a movie, at the end of you know ninety five minutes, I'm just getting to know the characters usually. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when people talk about sequels and things like that being um, kind of a um, you know, a sellout or I don't know what the, what, it, you know, any kind of negative connotation. I'm like, well, I don't think the stories, like, I think the best stories are in sequels or trilogies, you know, mm -hmm. you know like it, it, it's not, sometimes it always doesn't always work out, but. Origin but, stories um, are hard. You got to get a lot out of the way of an or in an origin story. Yeah. And, 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 and if you do it elegantly and you, you don't get that stuff out of the way, well, then you have a lot of holes that, that w are worth filling up. And that's yeah. been, what's become interesting to a degree. I just haven't had a chance to um, sink my teeth into it, but with limited television series, with limited series, mm -hmm. which is basically, here's a movie, we're going to tell it over six hours. Yeah. And it's like, then you get to, you don't have to cram certain mm -hmm. things into a movie that can really feel um, frustrating and, 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 and it feels like you're dumbing down a movie for for an audience for exposition yeah. or whatever, and um, and then it's but and that's also the fun it is hopefully being able to make stories that are a little more ambiguous, but it just requires a lot of people to trust mm -hmm. in taking a chance. But um, like we're developing a third boy movie, and mm -hmm. um, and of course the third <laughs> orphan movie, and and it's um, to me I just I love the characters, I love those worlds, and yeah. if there's something good that came out of one of the stories. Great. Um, we'll lean into that if we can, mm -hmm. if, and, but then it's trying to do something different, you know, um, to subvert expectations, like with the orphan film. Mm -hmm. um, even with this movie, there was someone who, who compared it to Wicker Man and mm. she thought she knew where this story was going to go. And she goes and it totally went somewhere totally different. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was really nice to hear. Yeah, I feel and, like there's a degree um, of like it's like M Night Shyamalan. If it's a if it's a William Brent Bell movie, mind the twist, mind the reveal, <laughs> the surprise journey you're going to take. You didn't know you would. And it's you know, and and a testament to so many filmmakers of the last couple of years um, who have made movies that have you know uh, something like Barbarian, you know, that has these crazy twists and and absolutely right, you know, hairpin turns, and um, and it's it just you know. And I, I think it was partly due to the COVID of it all um, that we got to make some take some chances in films over the last couple of years that, you know, it's um, now opened up people's eyes to making more unique movies. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say like I constantly learning and sometimes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, something I might learn on Orphan um, about forced perspective, I, it's yeah. probably not going to pay off in making Lord of Misrule. Maybe I'll get to use those lessons later. Mm -hmm. So the lessons are never immediate. You know, I, I don't get to yeah. like, but, but I'm always trying to get better. And so mm -hmm. for me, that maybe that's my yes. And of it all is, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and I think anytime when you're making a movie, um, you know, it's an opportunity to create things, elements, mm -hmm. performances, story lines that will live on forever. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's let's really 
take swings, you know, Mm -hmm. and sometimes they'll fall flat and that's, you know, can't worry about it. And sometimes they'll work and, you know, with orphan in particular, orphan first skill in particular, it's like, you know, if people wanted to call bullshit on, on her, they could have, it was was an easy critique to to go, I don't buy it. Okay. But just for a second, take a moment and yeah. watch the movie and then see if you forgot, you know, that she's, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of ways to talk people into it, but, but I, but I'm like, uh, but that didn't happen. You know, yeah. people, people were fine with it. And, um, and then it's like, oh, great. Now we can make a hundred of those movies if you want to. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so taking those chances, it's, it's only when people do it that it pays off. Um, and if you don't take chances, um, you know, you never know. Um, and then you're just going to be f- filled with regret of not trying to do something interesting um, mm-hmm. or different or unique or, or that stands out. Well, and, and getting like you were saying, like getting like feeling so good about the, the past two movies you've made and, and, and being able having for you a rewatchability of, of your most recent film, Lord of Misrule. You know, how does that kind of, you know, like you said, Steven Spielberg shows up. He's not even storyboarding. Um what does that enable you in yourself to like want to do when you feel maybe less restrained by like, you know, like you said, the imposter syndrome perhaps or fake it till you make it. But when you feel like you faked it long enough to actually be it and then you've made it and now you are in the mastery stage of it, perhaps what does that open your mind up for maybe things you previously thought were possible for you, but maybe now they are like, how does, how does that kind of open your brain? I mean, that definitely uh, gives me a certain amount of confidence in some things, but of course, if you think, you know, you've got something figured out, then it's like, <laughs> yeah. well, then you're just not, you know, you're not thinking about it enough. It's like, I'm the furthest thing from ever feeling comfortable, but, um, but what I get most comfortable about is, 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 Pushing ideas, like I'll give you an mm. example, like with Lord of Misrule, um, Einstein, he, um, you know, I worked with him before and we remained friends and I knew I wanted him to be involved in the movie. Um, but the character Jocelyn was written as a 70 year old woman. Mm-hmm. And we were already in the UK prepping the movie cast. You know, we had been casting her part for on and off for a couple of years. Oh, wow. And, okay. um, and so I gave him the script and I was I came down to his local pub and and he read it um, and I came to, but right before I went to go meet with him, you know, uh, with the producing partner in London, it was kind of frustrating trying to figure out this. And this, it's a pretty demanding role. Okay. And, um, and I was like, uh, God, what if I asked Ralph to play Jocelyn? <laughs> and, um, and he was like, fuck yeah, man, that's fucking crazy. <laughs> and so, all right. And so I went and we sat and we talked about the script and he said, yeah, I don't, I, I you know, he talked about play, doing a cameo and, and um, and I was like, no, you know, I have a question for you. I was like, would you be interested in playing Jocelyn? Mm-hmm. And of course, like I said, she's the main villain in the movie. She's mm-hmm. um, an older woman and uh, very witchy kind of. And he just was like, I oh, yeah, think about that. And then his mm-hmm. you know wheels just started turning. Yeah. And um, and we even were going to change the name of the character, you know, to Jack or something. And yeah. we both were like, no, it's it's Jocelyn. And still to this uh-huh. day, I speak when I talk about Jocelyn. Um, I talk about her as a her. Um, uh-huh. She's still in my mind a female, and then the, the the writer, yeah, and 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 the writer was like, "I love Ralph, man, but uh, you know we're shooting in three weeks, and now I've got to rewrite the whole character. I, I wrote this really strong female character, and now mm-hmm. I got to rewrite it." And I was like, "No, don't don't change anything. Don't mm-hmm. you know? It's like this is just going to be, you know, Ralph's interpretation, but which just get gave it." Because I personally am not a big fan of writing for any type of person anyway. Mm-hmm. We're just all people. And mm-hmm. um, and so we didn't change anything except for, mm-hmm. you know, his description. And, um, you know, and I called the, called the producers. were like, okay, so didn't ask their permission other than, you know, my, par- my partner at the time. And, um, and they were like, okay, yeah. And the crew is all ready to do a fitting for Jocelyn. And now mm-hmm. Jocelyn is Ralph. And, um, and so that kind of trust that they gave me to do that, you know, and go, 
nothing is set in stone with the movie. You know, when they say it's a blueprint, like you have to have a really great script and you really want a great shooting plan. Um, but at the same time, you know, being open to th- different ideas. And that's a was a pretty big idea that changed the complexion of the entire movie. Mm-hmm. I, and the more I do something like that, the more I feel confident to do it next time, you know, and, uh, and there's a movie coming up and it's kind of science fiction horror and, uh, and it deals with drugs to, to a degree and where they disassociate and, um, and there's, they kind of have, you know, they dance a bit, but yeah. I'm like, okay. And I'm talking to the AD and he's like, okay, we'll have a, choreographer the day before and i go no 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 we need a choreographer for a week and we had the, it's going to take us four days to shoot this sequence because it's going to be a huge dance number and they're like oh we didn't know that it just said they you know they dance a little bit like in two lines yeah. of the script but i'm like no i really want it to be like a la la land you know okay bigger than life sequence so amazing so, so the, those yeah those ideas of, of continuing to push and have fun in movies it's not just a crazy idea. It, it's it's now we can point to great movies that are successful yeah. on every level. So so it's an exciting time to make movies and um, an exciting time for me to push ideas, you know, instead of getting becoming complacent or anything like that. Yeah, well, and it, it, I mean, it seems like you know there there's a lot of reasons to feel like a, 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 a weight of the reality of theatrical right now, and like there's a lot of things to like feel grim about with the entertainment industry, but then you look at something like this, you know, the things that you're talking about and the movies that have set new sort of standards for weird um, yeah. that hopefully people can look at as like something to aspire toward. And then you look at box office performance this year. And of course, like Barbenheimer is a fun novel yeah. to be able to talk about, but that you still have like the, like I think the highest grossing movie of the year is like, a, like a satirical subversion of a very well-known like, piece of pre-existing property in Barbie from Greta Gerwig. And then you have another one of the highest performing movies of the year is a three hour, you know, movie for grownups, as they say from Christopher Nolan, that feels almost like a crime procedural about the creation of the atom bomb. So like if those two (laughs) things can be like these twin phoenixes rising, to me, that suggests possibility. You know, I feel like you are an example of like that, like the movies you're talking about are possibility at a more like common budget level, but then too, sure. we have that at a hundred million dollar budget level yeah. to be like, but Hey, guess what? We can dare to do something over here too. Like we don't necessarily, we don't have to sanitize. We don't have to sterilize and we can tell original stories at this, the heights of cinema as well. The, the, well, the resource heights of cinema that is. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, was so impressed when I saw, I did the Barbie and Hyber weekend and mm-hmm. um, I love Barbie. And mm-hmm. then, um, and Oppenheimer, I was, you know, I was like, wow. Cause it, you know, it's <laughs> That's long my favorite movie. Christopher Nolan movie in a long time. I, I loved that. And, and I was just looking around, it was sold out. I mean, so all the screenings were sold out. The seats we had weren't great. And, and I'm looking around, I'm like, nobody, it, it was a regular movie going audience with mm-hmm. popcorn. And, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. how, how is this happening? You know, it's like, it's, it's great. It's it's um, a testament to just reminding the entertainment industry or, or creatives that people, mm-hmm. you know, don't just need superhero movies. Right. It's like there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of there's there's a lot of things that can be interesting. And there are a lot of uh, audiences will go and sit through that spectrum of movies mm-hmm. equally. It's exciting. And, and with luckily for our little genre, you know, theaters still play a big part yes. in it you know and i think finally maybe people have, re- have finally have you know it's not horror is back or something yeah but um that that it's not just even about movies you know mm-hmm. it's about halloween it's about trick mm-hmm. or treat it's about universal horror nights haunted houses immersive theater mm-hmm. um it's just movies is one offshoot of people liking to be kind of scared mm-hmm. and um so it's 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 that's why I think it it stands up so well. Um, I mean, it's a communal experience, of course, but it's just one of the best parts of b- being scared mm-hmm. um, is is movies. Um, but it's one of many ways that people seem to love it. And yeah, it's it's a great place to experiment. Which, like you said, I mean, it, people are experimenting on a huge level right now, like on on such big budget levels, um, which is exciting. Um, and it's always this way, you know, 
uh, pop culture is always so cyclical. It's pop yeah. music and then it's writer, direct writer, musician, music. And, you know, so this is a cool time to be creative. Well, okay, then that, that gets into the, 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 the closing question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, for you to like, I'm so happy to feel so like optimistic about making movies right now and you know, after this, <laughs> you know, through this conversation and, you know, compared to, you know, early on in your career, a movie like Stay Alive at the height of the like Michael Bayization of horror, the, the, the remake machine is in full effect. Again, I am a lo- I am a student of odds horror. <sighs> I spent a lot of time analyzing it, breaking it down, but like, you then like you at that time compared to you now would you say you have more creative room or more optimism about your creativity now compared to then or is it just like there are pros and cons to both like how would you sort of set past you and future you in conversation about like the possibility of what you can make as a filmmaker um you know there's that great kind of uh it's a quote about taste and about like being creative and it's like you have ideas you know and it just doesn't always come through in your work it, mm-hmm. you know for different reasons um and something like stay alive uh i love that movie but there were mm-hmm. so many shackles you know specifically mm-hmm. and that's a big part of what i learned were things of going i need to be you know have my hands in the editing you know like mm-hmm. literally edit and um but then they were like, oh, that's okay. It'll, you, you'll get, you know, they kind of talk me in circles around that. And I'm like, it really does hurt the movie. It's kind of what I was saying about the fire stuff in Orphan. And so, I mean, I'm more excited and optimistic in every way now. Mm. Um, but I was ex- extremely optimistic and excited then. And, and sure. even a movie like that was, you know, um, has, you know, was a really big concept, you mm-hmm. know, that, um, it's frustrating. We didn't make a game and we would have been on our fifth game by now and yeah. all that stuff. And, um, and so just the, the, the part about it, that's good. Now it feels just more, um, there feels more control, um, and mm. just more confidence and trust in myself and in the people around me. And mm-hmm. then knowing, I mean, you know, you always learn lessons of what not to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. and after a while, I really, that really becomes a, um, a frustrating, like I'm, I'm, t- I, I'm ready to learn what to do, not what not to do. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but, it, and sometimes it's, it, it's just process and things that you may not have control over and going, mm-hmm. okay, I need to make sure I have control over that next time. Mm-hmm. And then I'll make sure I gotta have that handled next time. And, um, so I feel like the things that I, like when I say wa- watching my old, other movies, um, it's kind of like being cringy you know Mm -hmm. i cringe a lot at them whereas these last two movies um i don't cringe and (laughs) um as much or at all really and some i don't cringe a lot it's just some but a lot of those cringe worthy moments you know are things that weren't the the intention to begin with so i know that if i had made a quiet place the studio the people i worked with at different times would have said great movie we love it let's do this by the way they have to talk though Mm -hmm. you know and it's like (laughs) well the whole thing is that's the whole thing it it is is there's not going to be any talking yeah and so it's it's getting finding that kind of uh trust to take swings like that with Mm -hmm. with with the movie um and if it was stay alive it would have been like no people this video game thing isn't just a little tiny piece of the movie yeah and one day people you know, and they're like, they made us cut so much of the game out of it before it was ever finished. And now here we are 20 years later, 15 yeah. years later, and Twitch, on Twitch, you know, people, millions of people watch mm-hmm. people play video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it came to fruition. And so it's 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 having the trust of the people around me and um, and then in myself and, and the team to take those ideas and go, no, if we're going to do this idea, then we really have to go full on and do it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise it's, it's just, I'm going to cringe about it later or have just <laughs> regrets, you know? So yeah, that's the conversation between those two versions of mm-hmm. me sort of is, is just make sure everybody knows to, to follow through with every idea as best as we possibly can, you know, and just trust that it will work. Well, I am so glad that you, uh, in, in being able to be more audacious, that you have brought yourself to a place where you can, insist upon a Ferris Bueller-esque 
built out dance number, go full La La Land in your in your genre film. Uh, it feels like a real coming together moment for the Ferris that you were born as, clearly. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> just William Brent Bell, thank you so much for your time. I have been looking forward to talking to you for such a long time. I'm so grateful I finally got the opportunity to do so. And thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, and Lord of Misrule will be available in theaters and on demand December 8th. So mark it yes. down, everybody. Yes. Thank you so much. This was great. Huge thank you to William Brent Bell, the Ferris Bueller of the Feeling Scene podcast, for sure. It was such a dream to get to speak to him. I truly love his films, and I look forward to whatever is coming next. As I mentioned, his new film, Lord of Misrule, is out December 9, and that is tomorrow if you are listening to this on Drop Day, which of course you should be. Uh, So go check it out and see why he thinks it's his best work yet. By the way, that quote that Brent mentioned at the end about creative people and their taste not always coming through, it's from Ira Glass, and we'll put the whole thing in the show notes. And now, one quick thing before I go. It's the holidays. If you're out there celebrating Christmas and you have some gifts to buy for people, then there have been some Feeling Scene contributors, co-hosts this year, who've put out books. And you can buy books all year long. It's not just the week they come out. You don't have to, it's not just when you pre-order them. So, for example, Manuel Betancourt has The Male Gazed that you can purchase uh, for yourself, for a loved one, stuff a stocking with it. Uh, Anna Bogutskaya has unlikable female characters. Kyle Turner came out with The Queer Film Guide this year. And Malachi Moore has Haunted Reels by Dark Matter Presents. That's just, those are just the books that have come out from our co-hosts this year. Obviously, people come on and they pitch their movies. You can support the independent cinema that we have featured here on this show this year. And you can watch big movies like the one Christopher Landon directed for Netflix called Ghosted. Like, there's there's never a bad time to um, especially get out there and buy a book from an author, a scholar who is out here doing the critical work of cultural analysis. Um In a landscape where, uh, honest to God, trust where the information can feel hard to come by, but we stand behind, we stand behind uh, the people who are publishing, who have come on Feeling Seen, and hey, I'm sure they would love it if you put their work out into the world, and you know what I bet you would love it too if you read them. I, you know, am so excited to dive into Kyle's book and the treat of something like An Unlikable Female Characters, a queer film guide, you can go through those and guess what? You have a watch list for the year to come. So with it comes the most enjoyable kind of resolution you could possibly make, which is to watch more movies and they'll tell you exactly where to start and give you critical framing for these kinds of films. And that is super exciting. And that is also, in addition to the excitement, that is our show. And guess what? If you love feeling seen, you can now let the world know with some new merch... We also have merch as well. We have little things that we sell. We just added a whole bunch of really cool, canonically queer stuff to the Max Fun store. It isn't too late to make an order for a holiday gift. Uh, even your loved ones who don't listen to the show, um, I'm holding you responsible for that not being true, would still look pretty awesome in a canonically queer muscle tee, right? Any muscle tee I wear is canonically queer because I'm queer and that makes it canonically so. And you can find all that at maxfunstore.com. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Feeling Scene Pod or send us an email at Feeling Scene at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Jor Crew on Twitter. Our theme music is by Andrew Eben. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows supported directly by you.